One of the most brutal and savage events that could take place within a castle's walls was a siege. Castle owners, royalty and soldiers would dread the thought of an invading enemy laying siege to a fortification in an aim to take the position. Throughout history thousands of sieges have taken place, in which many have been successful, and some which haven't. In this video we're going to look at this tactic of warfare, and consider the question, how would you lay siege to a castle? To support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. First of all, let's look what siege really is. A siege is a military blockade of not just a castle or a fortress, but also it can be a blockade of a city too. In the medieval times, towns or cities had walls and this would allow sometimes sieges to take place, with the closing of the gates. The aim of a siege is to conquer by attrition, to grind down those people stuck inside the area over a long period of time. Sometimes the idea of a long and slow starving of the people inside is met by assaults using siege weapons such as trebuchets and so on. Siege warfare is a constant and low intensity form of conflict, and usually the party inside, whatever is being besieged has a strong and static defensive position. The side doing the sieging will always usually surround the area and cut off all the supply routes in and out of the area, aiming to starve and convince the defenders to give up through negotiations that could go on. A siege would usually occur when the attackers come across a city or a fortress that cannot be easily taken by a quick assault, and when the defenders refuse to give up their positions or surrender. Sieges can often be decided by negotiation as mentioned earlier, but also with the starvation of a settlement by disease or thirst caused by the lack of supplies reached to the area. The main focus of a siege was that nobody could leave the area or a castle, or nobody or nothing could enter the castle. This would lead the commanders of the siege army with a need to balance their goals, do they either wait it out and starve the defenders, or do they use siege engines and weaponry to break in and fight? Commanders would need to weigh up the cost of human life, and also the sheer time that it would save with storming and breaking the siege. Attacking forces could also sometimes build their own defensive or earthworks, such as ramparts and ditches, to help intimidate or attack the defenders. This is known as circumvallation, and during this process the attacking force could be set upon, and throughout history this has been done when there's a lengthy siege. In fact, attackers to an area have even built a ring of forts themselves to allow them to be defended from other attackers. As technology progressed, different ways of besieging or defending a castle came to fruition. We all know about catapults and trebuchets, and how using weaponry such as crossbows and cannons could help siege a fortification. This would later transition to the use of muskets and guns, and sieges are still used today in some respects. Siege warfare dominated in Western Europe for most of the 17th and 18th centuries, which resulted in extremely long conflicts. Siege warfare was very expensive and slow, but was very successful, and more so than encounters on a battlefield during this time. One exception to this though was English Civil War, where any sort of military action which seemed to be a struggle was avoided and resented by the Roundheads and the Cavaliers. In England, sides wanted to end a conflict quickly. Sieges however were inevitably used during this time in order to snuff out the royalist influence and areas of power by the parliamentarians. Now sieges during the medieval times often depended on a type of fortification that was being attacked. Let's first look at the first type of castle that was really deployed in England on a large scale, the Motton Bailey. Before these there were fortified towns such as Burrs, these were walled towns or settlements that had everything inside. Due to their walls they could be sieged easily, and as they were made of wood, they could also be threatened to be burned down, to help persuade defenders to give up. The Motton Bailey Castle brought to England by William the Conqueror had many advantages such as the fact they were relatively easy and cheap to make using wood, however a huge negative was the fact they could easily be besieged. The Motton Bailey saw the classic keep or castle building sitting on top of a mot, and the perimeter was fortified by a wooden fence known as a palisade. If an invading army however wanted to besiege the Motton Bailey, this was very easy to do. The defenders would cut the drawbridge and would isolate the bailey and the rest of the inner walls of the castle if they were surrounded, but if an attacker had made it within the actual walls of the palisade, the keep and the inner bailey could furthermore be isolated by the defenders by the destroying of the flying bridge that linked the bailey to the keep. This would be a last bastion of defence for the castle's owners and guards, but it was incredibly easy then for an attacker to now just starve and wait for the defenders to run out of food, supplies, or for them to just simply give up. 
as Stonekeep castles came with a transition from the Mott and Bailey to a more permanent fortification, there was a much more complex design of castles that also came. Areas such as Barbicans rallied to help guards to defend the castle. Castles would now also have extremely thick curtain walls, which were designed to prevent arrow fire and also to stand firm against large siege weapons and cannons. So the idea of attacking these fortifications may have been less attractive than it used to be, so possibly commanders may prefer to starve the defenders rather than to attack. The defending armies would have a number of options to break a siege. Normally castles were well stocked and had a large reserve of food, when coupled with rationing they could possibly hold out for even 6 months inside the sealed fortification. The biggest defence against the siege however would have been access to a well inside the castle's walls. This could then provide the guards with a solid and consistent water supply that was fed by underground water or a river. Chances are with this, the invading forces wouldn't know about it. Armies could live without food for weeks, it would be rather tough though, but they could only live for a matter of days without water. You however with a water source, do run the risk of attackers poisoning the water. This would usually be found within a number of days. Once the siege army surrounds the area and cuts off the supply routes, they would have known about a hidden water source. Some defenders throughout history have attempted brave breakouts during sieges to break siege weapons, start fires and by murdering the attackers during their sleep, but this was hugely risky, ultimately giving up the high ground of the castle or by opening access for a short period of time. So to conduct a siege you had a number of different options to work with. Do you either aim to starve the defenders over a long period of time in a battle of attrition? Do you start by starving them and cutting off supply routes and then attempting to storm the castle? Or do you just attack? Well let's have a look at a number of famous sieges and see how they managed to end. When King John came to the throne in 1199, he was rather unpopular, losing much territory and raising taxes heavily. Dover Castle was one of the most advanced castles in England, overlooking the English Channel and it was strategically important. Because of John's unpopular reign, the barons rebelled against him and went for Dover Castle. John made sure that the castle was well stocked before running off to Kent, leaving 140 knights and many other soldiers inside the castle. Dover Castle would then be besieged, with the outer walls being bombarded and a siege tower being created. The attackers would use miners to dig through the soft chalk to undermine the timber barbican. The French future king, Louis VIII of France, who had been invited to take the English throne, then had his army storm the castle, killing Dover's commander and the defenders then ran back to the safety of the stone walls. A new mine was then dug to bring down the tower of the main gatehouse and the tower eventually collapsed. This was then met with brutal hand-to-hand -hand fighting as the attackers tried to enter the breach but the defenders would see them off and closed up the castle where the walls had fallen. The frustrated French commander Louis would then strike a truce with the defenders and following John's death of dysentery left Dover to fight up north. He would then later return to besiege Dover again in May 1217 and he built a trebuchet called Bad Neighbour which was probably the first built in England. Ten days into the siege he found out that his army had been routed in a battle at Lincoln this led to Louis abandoning the siege and returning to London, so here's an example of a siege which was rather unsuccessful. Fast forward to the English Civil War and moving north to Scarborough, the castle here was the scene of one of the longest and bloodiest sieges of the Civil War. In 1642, Sir Hugh Cholmley was sent to Scarborough to hold the castle for Parliament, but he switched to the Royalist cause. For the next few years, Scarborough would be a key base for the Royalists and a fawn in the side of the Parliament. In 1644, Parliament defeated the Royalists nearby at Marston Moor and captured York, leaving Scarborough cut off. The Parliamentarians then closed in on Scarborough and Cholmley negotiated to buy himself some time and to improve the castle and the town's defences for the inevitable siege. He managed to hold the town for three weeks before finally retreating to the castle. Rather comically, the siege was put on hold as a key Parliamentarian commander fell 200 feet from the cliff whilst trying to catch his hat which had been blown by the wind, but somehow he miraculously survived the fall. After recovering the bombardment of the castle began, with the country's largest cannon being set up beneath the castle, battering the walls with huge cannonballs. The royalists inside the castle would fire back damaging the nearby church. The intense bombardment lasted three days and this led to parts of the great tower or the keep breaking and half of the building collapsed. 
Remember, this was a huge and ornate structure which stood proudly over Scarborough. At this point, the parliamentarians launched an attack, but was repulsed showing how great the defenders were at their role. A later commander decided that this repetitive and brutal fighting was futile, and decided instead to just blockade and bombard the castle. The ammunition of the royalists inside the castle's walls was running out, and after the siege lasted five months, the defending commander gave in and surrendered the castle. Only half of the castle's 500 defenders had survived, and only 25 of them were fit enough to fight, with many being starved from the lack of supplies. So in this sense, this rather brutal siege deployed many different methods, but eventually, starving the enemy and cutting off the supplies was the most effective. So in conclusion, to besiege a medieval castle or any city in fact, you needed a number of things. Firstly, you needed a rather good army, and this army needed to have the resolve to be able to stand the test of time that is required with attrition warfare. You could also use huge weapons or siege engines, and as warfare transitioned past the medieval times, cannons were hugely effective. The key parts of a siege, to reiterate, are certainly through the cutting off and restriction of supplies coming into the fortification or castle. With this, it led you to ultimately a point in time where the defenders would either be forced to surrender, would be incredibly weakened by their lack of supplies, or even would have to attempt a desperate breakout. Sieges were incredibly effective when it came to warfare, and for defeating an enemy and taking a stronghold or strong point. It seemed though that the best sieges ended with negotiation and conceding of a castle, for this wouldn't usually lead to much loss of life on both sides. Interestingly, the famous Corfe Castle saw an incredible story of Lady Mary Banks, the wife of the castle's owner, who defended the castle against two sieges during the English Civil War. In fact, during this time, she displayed so much bravery and defiance that she was eventually allowed to keep the keys of the castle. Once again, thanks for watching. We hope you've enjoyed this video. To support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. Once again, thank you so much for watching.